librarian with the Programming and Learning Department. I'd first like to begin this evening by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. Tonight's event is in partnership with Vancouver Writers' Fest, and the Vancouver Public Library is pleased to present this evening's event of Insight, which is an exploration of books and ideas. The Vancouver Public Library I like this because it's like an obstacle course it uh, is. to get to the chair. <laughs> you can't figure it out. You don't deserve the chair. And you lose five points for every for piece of furniture you touch. It doesn't go by. Yeah. Um, Not that it's a competition. No, no, no. How, how, how did George Saunders do? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, George. That's another story. Um, of course, every creative artist, uh, whether they're working in screen or with novels, fiction, poetry, whatever, uh, is concerned about how it's going to get received. And I'm wondering whether with the book, waiting for the reviews and the reception was any different than waiting for the reviews and the reception to movies, or are they simply the same? Um, I will answer that, but first I just want to say thank you everybody for coming, um, uh, and for the Writers' Festival and the library for having me. Um, uh, it means a lot to me. You know, um, in Vancouver, where I was born and raised, and to have so many friendly faces. Uh, this, you know, I've, I've been traveling a lot uh, for the book, but uh, this in particular, it feels very, um, very meaningful and emotional, and I'm just really grateful to see you all here. So thank you. Um, uh, to answer your question, I mean, no, it, it is different. Yeah. Um, well, as a screenwriter, I mean, you know, my last movie, The F Word, I was very proud of it. The movie was very faithful to my script. Uh, you know, did well, but like, no matter how successful a movie that you wrote is, like a screenwriter is still like the like ninth or tenth most interesting person <laughs> on the list of people to talk to. Yeah, director. Yeah, I mean, like you know, like a lovely actress named Sarah Gadden uh, was like in one scene in the movie. I think she like did more interviews for the movie than I did, which is fine. I mean, as a screenwriter, you or you if you, if you're not comfortable, uh, just. Uh, you know, sort of like letting your work speak for itself and standing behind the director and the cast. Yeah, yeah, you should write novels. So here I am. Uh, <laughs> the, um, you just wanted all the attention. Yeah, yeah, you were tired of yeah. sharing. Um, but I mean, also like as a, I mean, a novel is much more. It's much more direct. I mean, as a screenwriter, you are behind. You know, there's the, the director's eye. There's the performances of the cast. There's the editor. Um, with a novel, like, these are the words that I wrote, and that's that's it. If you don't like it, you you know, it's it's exactly as I intended, which is fine. I mean, not everybody's going to like it, but it's it's a much more vulnerable uh, place to be in. Do you remember the first review that you saw? Uh, I'm sure it was good, so I don't remember it. Uh, <laughs> I only remember the bad ones. <laughs> the ones yeah. that um, no, but I mean, but look, the, the truth is, though, I mean, obviously, you're thrilled if you have good reviews. Mostly, I'm happy that there's good reviews because you know they put the paperback out with all the reviews, and if you don't get any good reviews, they have to like really stretch, right? Or pay guys like me to write. Right. Them. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy for the publisher that they have something to put on the cover and the back of the book. I, I think as a screenwriter, over the years, because I've been doing it for a long time, you get pretty good at just self rewarding. Like if if you don't, again, it's like if you don't just take pleasure in the writing process in doing the best job you can with the words, um, trying to make the best movie you can, with, with full awareness you're not going to get much uh, love from like the media or whatever, um, or reviews or anything like that. If you can't, if, if that you're not okay with that, you're not going to survive as a screenwriter. And so I found that I'm kind of self-correcting. Like I, it's nice to have good reviews, I'm happy people like it, but mostly I just wanted to write a book that I was proud of. Some of the best advice uh, I've heard creative writing instructors give to students is, don't go into this wanting to be a writer. Go into this wanting to write. Because yeah. that's ultimately the only thing you can guarantee f for yourself is that is that you can write and, yeah, and you enjoy don't, it. If you don't take pleasure in it, it's the day, I mean, this part of it, which is lovely, is like 1% of my life. Most of, 99% of my life is like sitting in a room by myself, totally dressed as nicely as this, yeah. um, <laughs> just typing hunched over the keyboard, trying to remember to sit up straight uh, so I don't get a back problem. And, uh, and and so, I mean, if you don't love that part of it, then 99% of your life is going to be tedious. You can't do that just for this part. Um, 
part of the promotion of a book these days seems to be questionnaires that, uh, and maybe because it's, it's easy for the media to slap a bunch of questions down in front of a, a writer and say, email back the answers. But yeah. there was one of uh, those questionnaires where you answered a question about what book you felt you should have read but hadn't read, and you said Ulysses by James Joyce, and there's a great story behind that. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so in university, uh, I started as an English major, and I took some film classes on the side, and then I was in, uh, and I loved film, and, but then I was in this third year literary modernism class, and I remember very clearly the professor said, if you have not finished reading Ulysses by today, you cannot pass this class. And I had not started Ulysses. You weren't going to finish it that day. I wasn't. It's very long. And and then I sort of like, I had this like moment of clarity where I realized like, I, we kept getting assigned these books and then I would just like go out and rent the movie version of it. I was like, I'm like already a film major. Like I'm basically just watching the movies. And so that was like a moment of, of real, but I realized I was, I'm going to fail the class. And he told it to us on the last day before. I think he was very sly. It was like the last day you could drop a class and, and still sign up for something new. So I switched over to being a film major. All, all. And so this whole process of taking like 15 years to finally write my first book is because of Ulysses. <laughs> Let's blame James Joyce. Let's blame, let's blame your choice. While you were honing your craft as, as a screenwriter, did you have vague notions or any idea in the back of your mind that at some point fiction would be something you, you'd want to try? Yeah, eventually I wanted to try something just easy, like writing a book. Um, uh, I mean, I have to say, like, I always thought of myself more as a writer who happened to be working in film. Even with my screenplays, like I always took as much care as possible with every word and tried to create on the page like a, a literary experience for the reader. Um, uh, even though I knew that the vast majority of the audience, you know, the audience is never going to actually read the script, but for all the people who are going to have to finance and make and star in the movie, like they need to be inspired. They need to have like an entertaining emotional experience from the script uh, if they're going to commit years of their lives, their reputations, and sometimes their finances to making it. So I always thought of myself as a writer who happened to be writing in film. Um, it wasn't that I just, I, I, it wasn't that I said, oh, one day I'm going to write a novel. It was more that when I had the idea for this story, um, I, as I started to think about it, I realized the best way to tell the story would be as a novel. And so then I was faced with the question, well, is that what I want to do? Because like you said, like I didn't have a book agent or a publishing deal. I was a screenwriter making a left turn towards novels. Uh, a lot of novelists go into screenwriting, but it's yeah. a little... I mean, there are people that go the other way, but it's more uncommon. So it wasn't like this amazing career choice, but it was more like I had a story that I felt compelled to tell. And just to sort of, I guess, maybe a bit of a restlessness to try something new and challenge myself. You know, uh, in, in a lot of the early coverage of the book, there are often questions raised about uh, whether it's sci-fi or literary fiction, which is quite a, a, a jump. And in fact, I, I think there's a, quite a good argument to be made that it's literary fiction, which goes back to reinforce that, that you're a writer yeah. first. You're, you know, you weren't a screenwriter who decided to dabble in something else. I mean, for me, the, the, the genres are like where it gets filed in the bookstore. Um, I mean, there's lots of amazing novels. I mean, you know, it's like, what is considered science fiction or fantasy? It's like, well, if it ends up being embraced by readers over maybe one more than one generation, then it gets to go into literary fiction, right? Yeah, and um, it's a classic. Like when Vonnegut was first coming out, I, like, I, you know, he was just like pulp, right? And then now he's like fancy in the in the literary fiction category. I mean, I think that those categories are helpful, but to me, I'm, I'm writing a story and I'm using tropes of science fiction, but I am telling fundamentally a human, uh, emotional, kind of philosophical story about what gives your life meaning. Yeah. Um, we talk, have touched on the conception and the story of the book a little bit, but, but, but flesh that out, um, you know, how, how the idea started. Sure. I'm also going to turn to this side of the audience. Yeah. I feel like you guys are just getting my ear. And yeah. Uh, like self con you know, I don't, I didn't actually clean inside my, you know, I didn't, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of first novels, no, this is weird, um, like a lot of first novels, uh, I mean, it's sort of this like cocktail shaker of like all the things that interest me, 
and you just kind of like put it in there and mix it up. I mean, when I was a kid, um, my grandfather had this very extensive collection of old science fiction from the 50s and 60s, and I, I you know, I loved uh, those old kind of pulp paperbacks and anthologies, and not just the stories inside, but the kind of these, these covers, you know, these beautifully painted covers with all these sort of like futuristic cities and robots and adventurers and mad scientists. Um, and then, of course, growing up in Vancouver, Expo 86 was like a big thing for me. I, I'm sure like I actually didn't spend that much time at the fairgrounds, but in my mind, I was there like the whole summer. And, you know, I had a very close emotional relationship with Ernie the Robot. Um, uh, only people who actually remember Ernie laughed at that. Um, but, I, I, you know, but even then as a kid in the 80s, I had this sense that like the future wasn't really turning out the way these writers and artists imagined it was. Because you had that baseline of the books, yeah. uh, you know, the pulp your grandfather had. And so I, I it didn't come true. No, it didn't. I, it wasn't coming true. It certainly wasn't turning out the way they thought. Uh, they thought it would. I was just interested in that idea. Um, when I, I did my master's degree in uh, media studies, and I, I ended up studying what we sort of presumptuous, presumptuously call presumptuously. Is that a word? Yeah, yeah, it's a word. I'm a writer. Um, uh, what they call media futures, which essentially was looking at the history of technology and how it affected society to think about how technology was going to be affecting society moving forward. And so we would look at like, um, just yeah, the impact of technology on society, and that was just something that really interested me. Um, I made a swerve during, in the middle of my master's degree, I got an opportunity to write my, my first movie, um, which as a media theory student was obviously uh, the uh, 2001 masterpiece MVP2, Most Vertical Priming, which was uh, about a kid's movie about a skateboarding monkey. Um, but that was my first writing opportunity, and it kind of ended up swerving my life into writing movies away from these sort of academic interests. But I never really stopped being interested in that stuff. And just over the years, um, the ideas of the futures we thought we were going to have, um, these sort of imagined utopias, and why they didn't come true. I mean, there's obviously a lot of like practical, technical, logistic reasons, and also social and cultural and economic and political reasons. It just always interested me, and then. Um, the intersection of that with the increasing kind of dystopian nature of our visions of the future in popular culture and art and entertainment just interested me and then the idea of putting those two together um, really appealed to me. Now, that's not really enough of a reason to write, that's like a documentary, right? Uh, that's not really enough of a reason to write a story and then as I start to think about these characters um, and what kind of story I can tell about them, um, you know, my, my, my mother passed away in 2001, Judith Mass died, um, and it took a long time for me to in a place where I felt like I could write about it with enough distance and sort of like even insight. Like I feel like I didn't have, I felt like for a long time I didn't really have anything to say. Um, and, but then, you know, I think after several years, uh, I felt like I was ready to write about it. And the idea of writing about utopia and dystopia, and the futures we thought we were gonna have, and just these, um, the, and, and just the idea about the fragmentation of identity that happens in the wake of really profound loss of family or a spouse or, a, you know, um, uh, I, I just felt like an interesting way of writing about that in the context, but doing it in a way that would be, that involved time travel and alternate realities, because I guess that's my personality. <laughs> well, we're wandering into the book territory, which right. is a good thing. Well, we're wandering into a lot of territory. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I've, I've held you off from, from really diving into the book, and to be honest, it's because I'm, I'm uh, scared. Uh, it's scared because I'll say something uh, that will be a spoiler, right? So I'm going to let you do the basic outline of the book, so you will tell as much as you okay. think people should know sure. without ruining it. Well, it's a book. Yeah. <laughs> it's got covers. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, I mean, I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but I, I, basically, it sort of takes the premise of you know, we have all this, these ideas of dystopia in our popular culture, but what if our world, like what we think of as the real world, what if this is the dystopia? What if this is the worst case scenario? Like, what if something went horribly wrong and this is how the world turned out? Um, so the book is set in, in the present, 2016, 2017, but it, it, it opens in the version of the world um, that people in the 50s and 60s thought we were gonna have. It's kind of like dazzling techno-utopian version of the future where technology has solved all of humanity's problems. Um, well, it doesn't mean it solved all of like human problems. Like, people still have issues, and that's kind of where things go awry. There's a, um, an accident with a stolen prototype time machine uh, that ends up uh, with the protagonist waking up 
in our version of the world, what we think of as the real world, but which to him seems like this dystopia where everything's gone wrong. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, he wants to get back to his version of the world, but, you know, as he spends more time here, particularly with the versions of the people in his life that he finds here, it starts to make his decisions a lot more complicated. Existence is a thing you really shouldn't muck around with. Well, not, you know, I mean, not unless, <laughs> not unless there's more consequences. Yeah. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, uh, there's some real science underpinning uh, a lot of this book, and I'm not, I had one conversation on stage with a great physicist who told me everything uh, that I now still barely remember about physics. But, for example, it, it feels like there are elements of string theory in here in terms of kind of parallel realities. And did you do... I, I don't want to correct you in front of these people, but it's actually more like loop quantum gravity, which is sort of, of string course. theory's main competitor. See? Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> loop, whatever. There's two main theories of <laughs> quantum physics where they're attempting to kind of like reconcile everything. String theory is one, loop quantum gravity is the other. I mean, I think if you're, probably they're the same thing. I mean, one has strings, one has loops, but the, the people who are like really into it believe very strongly that the other people are wrong. And, and uh, whether it's one or the other, the, there is certainly, again, with string th theory, that sense of parallel realities existing side by side, but, uh, right. and going on sort of simultaneously. But my point was, obviously then, did you do that kind of, research or yeah. uh, did you know all that stuff anyway? Oh yeah, I super knew all of it. I have a film degree. Uh, the, uh, no, I, I... How does a camera work? Yeah, well, I can, I can explain it to you. Um, I like to figure out how things work. And I like, and so, I mean, the scientific research, um, you know, I, I came, you know, I developed all the, to kind of like create this utopian alternate reality that the book starts in, there's a lot of this kind of technology, and I like, I, I enjoyed spending time thinking about how it would actually work. And not just how it would work technically, but also like, okay, so you invent, so there are flying cars. What happens with flying cars? Okay, so what is traffic like if you have flying cars? And like, how does that affect your commute? Or like, and I, you know, I like to think about the sort of implications of things, um, both in terms of technically and also sort of socially. Um, and so I do a lot of research, but it's not just the science. I did historical research. Uh, I do research into like the, the places where, where the book takes place. Also, just the personalities of the characters. You know, the first person I actually got to read the book was a therapist that I know because I wanted her to like tell me, you know, psychologically, do the characters hold up? Are they coherent? Are the contradictions sort of like uh, that I intended there to be in the characters? Do they, do they make sense psychologically? So I like to do that research. I mean, the science stuff is flashy. And don't worry, there's like not like crazy amounts of science. But um, my feeling is like I do all the research and then just put the most interesting parts of the book. Because I, I, I think that whether it's science or history or just psychology, that's the stuff that gives the book the texture um, that makes it feel authentic. That detail. Thanks. Yeah, I love those details. You know, um, uh, a friend of the family who's here today, uh, Michael. You know, he's from he's from Hong Kong, and there's like a Hong Kong. There's a joke about like two Hong Kong neighborhoods in the book, and because I was in Hong Kong and I noticed it, I remember talking to somebody about it. I thought it was funny the way the names of the neighborhoods, and so it's like I put that joke in there. And if you haven't been to Hong Kong, it's not going to make any sense, but it'll probably just seem like a sort of a random line. But if you are from there. Then, then it's like, oh, that like that feels real to me. Yeah. And I like that. I think that um, universality in a book comes from being hyper specific because we all live in hyper specific environments. We don't live in sort of generalized, uh, abstract places. We live in real places. Why don't you um, read from the book and give people a sense of it? I'm going to read, and you guys were like, "What was he talking about? That's not what the book is like at all." Uh, sure. Okay. I'll read. I'll read from the book. Um, Okay. Uh, all right. I'm just trying to know what to read. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read a book. I'll read, I'll read a part of the book here. So just one thing you need to know, just for this to make sense. Um, this is like this is very, this is like page thirteen of the book. So I'm not giving away a lot. But um, part of the backstory. You know, one of the things I thought a lot about is like there's a lot of reasons, of course, why the world we imagine didn't happen. But one of them on a very fundamental level is fuel. I mean, putting aside all the catastrophic, catastrophic environmental implications of our dependence on fossil fuels, fossil fuels like aren't actually very good fuel. Like they waste a tremendous amount of energy, they're incredibly dirty. And so I thought about what one of the things that could have changed uh, the world is, is is if somebody had discovered a different a special a certain kind of fuel, a clean energy, a robust form of fuel. Um, 
back when it would have really mattered, like in the 60s. And so there's this character named Lionel Detrider. And all you need to know is he invented a, a, an important fuel source, which was incredibly important for this utopia, uh, for this to make sense. So this is chapter six. Also, the chapters are crazy short in this book, so even though we're on page 12, it's chapter six. <laughs> um, everybody's busy, you know. And people read phones on like their, or like read books on their watches now. So the chapters are short, so like you can be like, oh, I, I you know, somebody's like, what did you just do? And you, and you said, like, I read a whole chapter. It took me 45 seconds. All right. <clears throat> Anyways, chapter six. Nearly every object of art and entertainment is different in this world. Early on, the variations aren't that significant, but as the late 60s gave way to the vast technological and social leaps of the 1970s, almost everything changed, generating decades of pop culture that never existed, 50 years of writers and artists and musicians creating an entirely other body of work. Sometimes there are fascinating parallels, a loose story point in one version that's the climax in another, a line of dialogue in the wrong character's mouth, a striking visual composition framed in a new context, a familiar chord progression with radically altered lyrics. July 11th, 1965 was the pivot of history, even if nobody knew it yet. Fortunately, Lionel Gatrider's favorite novel was published in 1963, Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Vonnegut's writing is different where I come from. Here, despite his wit and insight, you get the impression he felt a novelist could have no real effect on the world. He was compelled to write, but with little faith that writing might change anything. Because Cat's Cradle influenced Lionel Gatrider so deeply, in my world, Vonnegut was considered among the most significant philosophers of the late 20th century. This was probably great for Vonnegut personally, but less so for his novels, which became increasingly homiletic. I won't summarize Cat's Cradle for you. It's short and much better written than this book. So just go read it. It's weary and cheeky and wise, which are my three favorite qualities in people and art. Cat's Cradle is about a lot of things, but a major plot thread involves the invention of Ice-9, a substance that freezes everything it touches, which falls out of its creator's control and destroys all life on the planet. So, spoiler. Um, Lionel Gatrider read Cat's Cradle and had a crucial realization, what he called the accident. When you invent a new technology, you also invent the accident of that technology. When you invent the car, you also invent the car accident. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. When you invent nuclear fission, you also invent the nuclear meltdown. When you invent ice nine, you also invent unintentionally freezing the planet solid. When Lionel Gatrider invented the Gatrider engine, he knew he couldn't turn it on until he figured out its accident and how to prevent it. My favorite exhibit at the Gatrider Museum is the simulation of what could have happened if the engine had somehow malfunctioned when Gatrider first turned it on. In the worst case scenario, the unprecedented amounts of energy pulled in by the engine overwhelm its intake core, triggering an explosion that melts San Francisco into a smoldering crater, poisons the Pacific Ocean with Tau radiation, corrodes 10,000 square miles of arable land into a stew of pain, and renders an impressive swath of North America uninhabitable for decades. Parents would occasionally complain to the museum's curatorial staff that the simulation's nightmarish imagery was too graphic for children, and since the experiment obviously didn't fail, why draw attention away from Gatrider's majestic contributions to human civilization with these grotesque speculations about imaginary global disasters? The simulation was eventually moved to an out-of-the-way corner of the museum, where generations of teenagers on high school field trips would huddle in the darkness and watch the world fall apart on a continuous loop. I'm not a genius like Lionel Gatrider or Kurt Vonnegut or my father, but I have a theory too. The accident doesn't just apply to technology, it also applies to people. Every person you meet introduces the accident of that person to you. What can go right and what can go wrong? There is no intimacy without consequence. Which brings me back to Penelope Weschler and the accident of us, of all of us. joking about, about the shortness of the chapters, um, but, but it is a striking feature of the book, and I'm sure that it was uh, more intentional than simply our short uh, attention span. Yeah, I mean, when I started writing the book, um, you know, like a lot of first-time writers, like I had a day job. My day job was writing movies, which is obviously an uncommon day job, but I'm turning over to the side of the crowd again. Hi. Um, but, uh, you know, I was writing on evenings and weekends, stealing time whenever I, whenever I could. I made a deal with myself. Because writing a novel, it wasn't like I called my film agent, just like, 
Good news, everybody. I'm writing a novel. Um, but uh, so I decided, I did it on my own on the side, and I, I would write just a little bit every day, 250, 500 words. And, um, and so initially, the, the structure of the novel um, was set by that. Each chapter was one day's work. And then after about seven or eight chapters, I realized this was reminding me of something, and what it was reminding me of was, was Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Cat's Cradle. And so I ended up, and then I went back and read the novel and realized, it was a very influential novel on me when I was young, when I first read it as a teenager. But I realized that a lot of the themes that he was writing about, not just about technology and society, but the connections between us, uh, the, the kind of, the way those connections give our lives meaning, the way that the people we meet, uh, particularly the unexpected ones, can, can, can change us and can change the trajectory of our lives. I realized he was writing about all that stuff in 1963, and so I ended up writing him and that book into the novel, uh, because if, like, if you're gonna steal from somebody, just like be really upfront about it. Um, and then I think also, I didn't really notice it when I was writing it, but I think as a screenwriter, I'm just used to short scenes. You know, most scenes in a movie are like two pages long. Um, and so I think it was, a, it was a comfort thing that I didn't even notice. But I also just, I like the pace of it. I like the momentum you get when you have short chapters. Um, and you know, uh, another big influence on me, it seems probably like a weird one, but uh, when I was a kid I loved Tintin. You guys, Tintin, you know the comics? One of the things I, and I just, and I, like, I love Tintin. One of the things I discovered later in life was that Tintin, we, we, we know them in the books, right? Like the graphic novels, but Tintin was originally published one page at a time. So every day, uh, or every week, an episode, one page of Tintin would come out. And so every page of Tintin ends on a cliffhanger uh, because he wanted you to come back and read it next week. And sometimes the cliffhangers are like, and then like a cat jumped out. But then like every, or like, you know, th you know there's a wind, the branch is blowing, that's what the noise is. And then the third one is like a guy with a gun. And so he kind of hooked you in and kept you going by ending each page literally on a cliffhanger so you want to turn the page. And I like to do that with the book. And so. A lot of, there's a lot of short chapters, but even though I say, oh, you can read one chapter and be satisfied, but the idea is each chapter kind of like makes you want to read the next one. Like, uh, nachos. <laughs> At the risk of wandering into the dangerous territory of theory, which I've blown once already, I'm going to try literary theory now for 200. Okay. Um, <laughs> We don't hear the word postmodern much anymore. I don't know why. Uh, but it seems to me that, that the book has an awareness of itself right. as a book. Uh, you've put in all kinds of self-referential uh, things to the author, the author of the author. Um, was that, how deliberate was that, and how much is that just fun and play? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination. Um, I, you know, what, as a screenwriter, a lot of the time, you know, you have the projects that you self-generate, that you pitch, and that you sell, and you try to get made, but a lot of what you're doing is you're taking jobs. You know, you get hired to write a movie, and you have to figure out what it is about that movie that is personal enough, uh, that you can get excited enough and passionate about it, connected to, so that you can actually go through the process of writing it and doing a good job, and not just kind of doing a hack job on it. And so, one of the things, a little technique for me that I, that I discovered was whatever my obstacle, whatever my problem with the project that I'm working on, give that problem to my main character. Um, sometimes it might be a slightly like a veiled or oblique version of it, but I, whatever my personal challenge is, I give that same challenge to my character. And so, as he or she works their way through the obstacles of the plot, and I'm also working my way through the obstacles of writing it, and there's a, a give and take. Sometimes the things I've learned, I give to them. Sometimes the things they figure out, they give back to me. And so I think writing my first novel, I was figuring out how to write a novel as I was writing, and having fun with that. Um, and, but then it also occurred to me that this, one of the choices that I made was, this protagonist comes from a version of the world where books don't really exist the way they do. Uh, sort of technology, not just uh, everyday technology, but storytelling technology has kind of taken society away from just the simple intimacy of a, of a book. Um, and so he is, the book is written as a memoir, and he is super nice to see you guys. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, you know, if you're below nine, that's like, I, 10 minutes is all you can take of me, I understand. Um, uh, and so I, I like the idea, I thought, like, in addition to me just having fun figuring out um, how to write a book and what books do well. Um, I, I thought that it was interesting that my character is writing a memoir, uh, it, but it's a form he is not familiar with. He did not grow up with books. And so it, it felt like an interesting way of um, being able to illustrate just how different culturally, socially, technologically, ideologically, philosophically his world is. 
it's a world where he's not sure what a book should be. And so that just, it was a, it was a way of taking my book. After the, before it was published to uh, a counselor, uh, someone, because he wanted to, to, to kind of do a reality check on the on the psychological part yeah. of, uh, of the book. And this is a book very much about uh, human relationships and how people connect and don't connect and, yeah. and manage themselves. Uh, what were you interested in most about that sense of human connection? Um, I mean, I, I find like chemistry to be people very interesting. What is, I mean, there's the family that you grew up in and the, the, the kind of that like intense, primal, essential connection you have. Um, and then there's the people you meet in life and you have this kind of connections to them. And like, what is that? Like, what is that feeling you have when you meet somebody and you feel that connection or, or and, and you decide to pursue it and it develops? I find that really, I mean, in my last movie, The F Word, I explored that in a different way. I find that kind of that, the chemistry in life is a very interesting thing. Like, and what is your sense of responsibility to that? What does it mean to you? How do the people we meet in our lives change our lives? Um, and then I, I, I'm interest, I was interested in the character, um, you know, the idea of time travel, alternate realities, what ifs. I mean, it's a very essential thing. We all think about these hinge moments in our lives where things could have been very different, decisions we could have made very differently, uh, how it would have ended up. But there's a sort of like essential narcissism where we imagine we would be living in a totally different life Everything would be different. We'd be happier, better, more powerful, stronger, cooler, whatever. But we would be the same. Like everything in the world would change, but we would be the same. Which is hilarious because, no, I mean, why would you be the same if everything else changed? How much of the core of who you are is just like some sort of like essential thing and how much of it is the result of circumstances? And so I like the idea, first of all, of peeling away everything a character has. All the things that he thinks are essential about himself. Um, and also, and, and the circumstances of, that create the people in his life, his family, this woman he has this romantic connection with. Um, you know, when, when their circumstances are peeled away, what kind of person do they become? And then there's a subsequent question, which is delved into later in the book, is we assume we peel all away all the layers of who we are, and there's a core, and that core is good. But what if your core is kind of like shitty? Like what if your actual core is not, not a great person and all those layers are there for like a really good reason? Um, and so what do you do then? And how do you, you know, as, as a character, so I, I enjoy the idea of peeling character away and then discovering that what was underneath was problematic and then like how he rebuilds himself. Well, you've led right into the next question, which was you created something of an anti-hero with Tom Barron, not uh, necessarily the, the most likable person at times in his behavior. Because he's very much like me, that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. I would not presume. Besides, you've got an army here. I don't pick fights with armies. Um, did you set out to give us a, a flawed hero, or did he get away from you? <laughs> did he? Um, no, I did. I mean, I I liked it. I mean, I first of all, I mean, I just wanted I wanted to write a character who sees himself as a very ordinary person in an extraordinary world, and then finds himself waking up in like what we perceive to be an ordinary world, and and he's in this extraordinary circumstance. Um, so that was interesting to me, and I just I mean, I knew where I wanted him to end up at the end. Um, and I knew the kind of person I wanted him to be at the end of the book, and so I wanted him to start as far away from that person as possible. Um, like I, I think that he's a complicated. Like I wonder about a complicated person. And at the same time, um, you know, I was also very aware, and this is early on in the book. Like he also, um, you know, he loses uh, his mother in the book in sort of very sudden circumstances. And I was interested, without it being like I was interested in exploring what grief, particularly sudden grief, the shock of it when you're not ready for it, does to you your decision making, your choices, how you see yourself and your identity, when the sort of like, uh, you know, we have the sort of like orbital kind of gravity of our personality and our lives, our families, and then like when one of those kind of bodies is, is, is you know, disappears, like there's a sense of unease, of discombobulation, of disorientation that we might not even notice when it's happening. So I was, I tried to be very compassionate to him and, and say like, Yes, he's making bad decisions, but there are reasons why he's making bad decisions. It doesn't excuse the consequences of his actions. Um, but at the same time, like I, I always wanted to understand that he's in a very hard time in his life, and so a lot of the bad, the mistakes that he makes are, are come from that. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we should forgive him. We should still we should want him to do better. But hopefully, the reader understands where it's coming from. Um, 
what kinds of lessons, aside from, and, and I know you're not writing a book that, that's got lessons that, that we should all um, It would be nice, about. though. I had this idea where, like, uh, I was going to have, like, some recipes at the end of the book, because I was like, if, even if you hate the book, these would be, like, really helpful recipes. Like, it would be, like, really good to know how to make, like, a really good, like, chicken soup, or, like, you know. Um, I, so it would be nice to have, I, that would be good. But my next book, I'm going to just have, like, a bunch of lessons at the end that you can just take with you, and you can tear it out even if you hate the book. I'm gonna skip the lesson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and go back to another character for the just for a minute here, who who probably wouldn't be considered a major character in the in the scheme of things, but I'm I was interested in the story of, of uh, how she came to be, and that's Greta uh, a sister. Yeah. And, uh, so talk about sure. How she came from. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I, I if, if you read the book, and you don't, it's okay, you don't have to, it's nice that you came. Um, but if you read the book, I mean, it's, there's a, it's, a com, there's a, it's a complex plot, there's a lot of uh, overlapping, there's, you know, time travel, there's alternate realities, there's multiple versions of the characters, and, and so I felt very strongly, like, I needed to plan everything out, um, but also have it very clearly in my head, like, when I was writing, I'm going to get to your, this leading to your answer. Um, and so, you know, I, I felt like if I can't keep this whole story in my mind, I can't expect the reader to. So I kind of worked on it and worked on it until I felt like I could have the entire story for all its complexities very clearly in my mind. Uh, and so I planned everything out. I planned all the characters are out. I had their arcs, not just the main character, but the supporting characters. But it's interesting because Greta is the one character who I didn't actually plan for. In fact, I was just writing the scene and then suddenly like, I like had somebody come in and I didn't even know who they were. I, originally in my mind they were going to be a doctor and then suddenly it was, it was his sister. Sassy sister. Yes, and well, I have two sisters. They have moderate levels of sass. Um, I'm sitting right there, um, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've created several uh, charts reflecting their levels of sass, which I can email to people if they like. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, his sister walked in and started talking to him, and I realized that because there were some parts of the book in my in my rough draft, my first draft, that weren't working, and I realized that is what the character needed. That's what clarified so many things about who he was, um, who decisions he made, the way he treated certain people in his life, and which I'm not like coming out against only children, I just want to say, uh, but I, I just, I realized that, that, that he needed a sister. I have two sisters, I grew up with two sisters, and it's, it's impossible for me to separate who I am from the fact that I'm also a brother and that I grew up with sisters, and they're like an intrinsic part of my identity. And so suddenly, and also, it, it also made, I had this worry that Tom's story, it was gonna be too easy to decide between the realities. And then, I, but when I realized in one version of reality, he's an only child, and in another, he has a sister, suddenly, it made everything much more complicated for him, because how do you decide on a world where you don't have a sibling? But also, what would it be like to be an only child who suddenly has a sister? Who is like essential to you and seems to know you better than anyone, and uh, and, and you suddenly you're relating to her in a way that that you don't relate to any other person in your life, male or female. And so I, I and so she kind of like blundered into the book and threw a whole bunch of my plans uh, into disarray. But in fact, actually, I think in a lot of ways saved not just the book but saved the main character. This is my my last question, so I'm I'm giving you a warning that uh, it's your turn next, and I expect to see lots of hands go up when we finish. And, and we have wound up. Or can make restaurant recommendations. It's also a slide. Oh, you don't know the restaurant. I guess things have changed probably a bit. Um, we've wound our way around to family and found ourselves at, at family. And you've talked about your sisters and, and your mother, Judith, who was a, uh, a very significant figure uh, in the cultural life of, of Vancouver. And her loss, obviously, uh, and you referred to it, um, has, has meant uh, a great deal. And I wanted to end by giving you a chance to, um, to talk about your own family, your mother, and, and the connection in, in the book to, to a fictional family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, this is a story about family. I mean, there's a lot of, as I said, time travel, and alternate realities, and flying cars, and teleportation, and big plot twists, and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, this is a book about, it's about family. It's about the people who are essential to our core identity, um, the family we are born in, and also the, the families we make as we go through life, that we build, and how um, the, 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 the emotional environment that we grew up in, because of those connections, because of the gravity of the people in our lives, 
for me, many of whom are here today, um, and how it, when you pull everything away, when you pull away technology and politics and economics and everything, what really gives our lives meaning are, is, is, are the people we love, you know, the, our family, our friends, the, the, you know, the partners we choose, the children we have. That's what actually gives, when you pull everything away, that's what gives life meaning. And so fundamentally, uh, although there's a lot going on in this book, it, it is essentially a story of a family that kind of loses its core and finds it again. And that connection to your mother? Well, she was a, you know, a profound, I mean, she was my mother. <laughs> you know, she was a profound part of my life and uh, losing her, you know, I mean, you know, when you go through the death of a parent, um, it's hard to even know how significant it's going to be in your life. I mean, on the one hand, you know that everybody goes through it, um, and it's just an essential part of life. But it doesn't—it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it. Um, it's hard. You know, I mean, it's hard to talk about, especially in this kind of environment. Although I know it's a warm crowd, uh, obviously, and there's a lot of people here who's felt the loss just as keenly and profoundly as I as I did. Um, it took a long time to feel like I was ready to write about her. I mean, there's, I, it's not my, it's not exactly her. I mean, there are obviously a lot of parts of her in the book. I'm writing fiction, just like the, there's a tempestuous relationship between the main character and his father, but, you know, my, my, I, I don't have that relationship with my father. Hello. Um, <laughs> it's not autobiographical uh, in that regard. Um, at the same time, I mean, you know, my mom, uh, as you said, was, you know, she was a brilliant woman. She was a, you know, she was a curator and a critic, and um, she edited an art theory journal, and she had just before, she, you know, six months before she died, she'd taken a job as a, a museum director, and it was the next, she was writing a book, and it was, a, you know, it was sort of like the beginning of the next <clears throat> chapter in her life, and she died. It wasn't as sudden as the death in the novel is, but it was still quite sudden, and still shocking and exhausting and disorienting, and that feeling that, this was not the way the future was supposed to go. This wasn't the way the world was supposed to be. Um, and it took a long time to recover from that. I think it, it took having children of my own. Not, it doesn't replace the person, but it, I think it's only, it was only for me having children of my own where I sort of found that new equilibrium that I'd lost when I lost my mother. Although I didn't realize, I didn't, you don't necessarily realize it at the time. You know, you know that you're feeling this loss and you're feeling grief and mourning, but that sense of like, how off balance you feel. I, it was, for me, it was having kids. I mean, it might be other things for other people, but for me, it, you know, so that, and I didn't have kids for, it was eight, you know, eight years later. It was a sense of like, oh, I re I, now I re realize what was missing. It was like I had been walking with a limp, and suddenly somebody gave me a good prosthetic made of children. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 we can lean on them. Uh, I'm sure the metaphor makes sense. Uh, and so he's just beginning as a writer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give him that. Yeah, and so, but for me, you know, I mean, I sort of said this before, but although the book is obviously, you know, this, this idea of what happens, the fragmentation of your identity, and that sense of when you lose somebody like that, it's not just that you've lost the person, that your family has lost this person, it's that you're, you know, that, like the people who are the closest to us are family members, our loved ones, they're, they're essential to our identity. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, although it makes the book maybe sound slightly more depressing than it is, because I don't think it's that depressing, um, is it's about somebody who is, has to, they go through, a, they're on a metaphoric level, finding the new version of themselves that exists in the wake of loss. Um, I said that was my last question, and I lied because I realized that I'm, I'm just dying to know whether the reported uh, deal of $1.25 million uh, for this book was in fact uh, true. Uh, well, uh, uh, you saw that on the internet, and I think we all know that you should just trust everything you read on the no, internet. No, Donald yeah. Trump tweeted it. Yes. That's yeah. how I knew. Yeah, uh, and it was really weird that he did that. I really know. Weird. But I, I, his, my advance was slightly larger than his, and so <laughs> he gets weird he about was that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, very, very mad. I technically can't go to the United States anymore. <laughs> I didn't get the confirmation. Question. Yeah, it's your turn. Yes. What was the accident of you writing the book? Oh, so the question is, uh, what is the what was the accident of me writing the book? So, um, 
Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the idea of the action is there's the intention and there's the unexpected consequences, you know. And um, my intention to write the book was I just had a story I wanted to tell, and I thought that this was the way to tell it. And one of the things that's been really, I mean, an act, I mean, first of all, I've had this like crazy book tour where I've had a kind of reaction to it. There's, you know, there's writers who are incredible influences on me, and I mailed them copies of the book, like not really expecting them to read it, and they do, and, and that's been really amazing to sort of feel welcomed into this literary world, which I was, I just have been an avid reader my whole life, but I never felt like a novelist in the same way, and so um, that has been a really lovely, I mean, uh, it could all go horribly wrong, and that could be the terrible consequence, but so far, so far the accidents have been, have been positive, but we'll see, you know, like, you know, many, many terrible things can still happen. <laughs> yes. One oh. and two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Glenn, with, the, with playing with time, could you speak a little bit about um, in these different uh, parallel universes? Did you feel like there was a different experience of time in both places? Like, um, hmm. and uh, and. Yeah, I mean, in a way, was that part of what you were playing with also with the kind of time travel aspect? I just was curious if you started playing with experiences of time. Um, no, but that's a very interesting question because, I mean, to me, I mean, I always think of time as a function of, I, I, time as a function of gravity, right? Um, you know, we, time is defined by gravity. And so as long as you're on Earth, uh, time progresses in the same way. Um, you know, we think of um, time kind of progressing relentlessly, we're constantly moving, you know, forward in time, and it can never be turned back, and it's sort of this essential human fantasy to be able to do that. But it's, we think of ourselves as sort of stationary, like right now you're sitting here slightly, you know, dead because I've been talking so much, but we feel like we're sitting here stationary, we're not moving, but of course, we know that we're hurtling through space at unimaginable speeds, right? Like right now, we're, we are all moving in about, it's a 49 parallel, so about 700 miles an hour right now, right? As we, as we spin around, we're moving around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. The sun is moving through the cosmos at over a million miles an hour. And I, I like, I, I loved that idea. Um, and it's been something that sort of interested me as a kid, since a kid, uh, since I was a kid, of like that, that, that sense of like, the reason why we don't perceive ourselves to be moving at incredible speeds is because of the limitations of human perception, right? Like our brains keep that information away from us because it's too too much, right? Um, and so, I, no, I, I don't I don't think I really grappled too much with like different experiences of time and the different reality, but it was more like different experiences of consequence, mm -hmm. uh, because that, of course, is the fundamental of the fundamental of time, which is that because we can't turn it back, we're always dealing with consequence. Yes. Um, the question is, is about writing, and um, what's your advice for writers who start doing short form and want to get into longer form, um, and, and your experience? Keep writing, basically. Just don't make it long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't stop. Yeah. You're stopping too soon. You're stopping too soon. Um, yeah, how did you tackle, I mean, screenwriting obviously is average 92 pages, yeah. you're not filling the page, but how did you tackle the whole thing as a lot of blank space? How did you take Screenwriting and then jump into like a 300 page novel? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the honest initial answer is like, I didn't know if I was going to finish the novel. I just like was starting it and I wasn't sure if it was going to actually go anywhere. And once I was finished it, I wasn't sure if anybody was going to actually publish it. Um, but I think it's just um, when you've been doing it for a while, like, I think that's a big, I think that's really hard when you're writing short films to figure out like what is an a feature length idea. You know, I mean like what it okay, so you sort of you do a couple short films, you have a sense of like what kind of story you can tell in ten minutes or twelve minutes. So what is like a, 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 a you know a hundred minute story? You know, and then and that's a big thing you grapple with I think when you're starting as a writer is like how much is too much, how much is enough. Um, you know, you see, you know, movies where like they try to cram, to the, you know, you're trying to cram too much into it. Other ones with, where there's not enough story and they're trying to pad it out. And that's an instinctual thing that you develop. So I would say that like over time, um, by doing it for a number of years, I got a handle on how much story is. Like I have a pretty intuitive sense of like what's like a two hour story. And I knew, and that was, originally you know, I was a screenwriter. So originally I didn't think about this as, an, as a movie. But I realized as my ideas were developing, like it wasn't, I, I, 
I couldn't tell the story in two hours and tell it the way I wanted to, and the expansiveness of it made me realize like a novel was the way to do it, and that, um, and that I needed the space to tell the story properly. Now I'm actually writing the movie version, so I completely screwed myself. I know, I was wondering. Um, and so I'm in the process of figuring out how to, how to like unravel. compress it down to its essential core. But I have, I mean, I'm joking. I mean, I'm, I'm actually not joking. It's horrible. But um, I, I, but I, I know that I wrote the book, so I have the book, and the book exists. And um, and so having written the more expansive version, I sort of I feel comfortable writing the, the sort of more compressed version because I know I have to tell it that way first. So the answer is time, experience, write a lot. And, and one of the other answers to that uh, question, and I think you even mentioned it in other interviews, and it's just one aspect of, of length and depth, is interiority, that, that when you can go into a mind and into ideas and into thoughts, it, it starts to, to expand and, and build out. Short stories tend to be much more sort of oblique and leave you wondering about certain kinds of things, motivations. But um, with a novel, you get to just wallow in it. You should have asked him that question. That was a much better answer. I, 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 for hire, yes. <laughs> so if you had access to a time machine, would you use it? And if so, what moment in history would you uh, well, the question, the question was if he had a time machine and could go back, would he use it and where would he go in time? I mean, um, uh, well, uh, unless I could be assured, first of all, that going back, like I wouldn't catch like a disease that existed then that has been cured or like it wouldn't cause some sort of profound ripple in the space time continuum. So we're assuming like a fictional place where I don't cause any, any, any damage. Um, well, uh, so my family, my father's side of the family uh, is from Morocco. Uh, my dad was born in Marrakesh, but the family left um, during the war. They had to escape um, uh, during the Second World War. And there's this whole kind of, so a family left. You know, there's this whole, all these like narratives about my family back then and where they come from. And I don't, they don't, it's not there anymore. And so I think, you know, also as I understand it, my father can confirm this as he's sitting right there. My, his, my great aunt was a pastry chef King of Morocco. Whoa. And I feel like I would eats. go back and try to eat some of her dessert. I feel like that's a reasonable use of a time machine. I mean, to go back to like Morocco, like in 1937, and just like have dessert with the Sultan of Morocco. How would I do with that? Yeah. Is it a waste of a time machine to, to, no. do, to have dessert? No, I think that's yeah. really I'm a big believer in dessert. <laughs> yes, the back. Um, in your travels, uh, whether it's part of this book tour or maybe your film work, as you go from places in the States and then there's London and maybe other places you've been to, such as Asia, have you been reminded of your inherent Canadianness? Yeah, and you know, it's, something, it's, it's funny that you say that because when I was in England, something that came up again and again in all the interviews was pe people felt like this utopian alternate reality that I created was like very Canadian. And like, they, 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 no, but this happened again and again where people like interviewers would be like, I feel like what you're describing is if just like the whole world was Canada. And I was like, that's such an interesting observation. Like I didn't think about it that way, but it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, basically if like, sort of like Vancouver could be like metastasized into the whole world, that's essentially what I was describing. I mean, um, when I was, you know, one of the things I think about growing up in Vancouver uh, is that, for me anyways, you're constantly reminded that the human scale is puny compared to the, the natural setting, you know, no matter how many buildings we build downtown. There's, the buildings are never going to be as impressive as the mountains, as the ocean. I mean, no matter how hard they try to screw up the skyline, like, they can't screw it up because of those mountains, right? And and, but I think I grew up with that sense of like that the human scale of things kind of ties into the, what I was saying about the way our perception manages um, speed and time. Um, I, I felt very, I don't know, I was always just really aware of that, of that, that the, what we're building is sort of like rickety and haphazard compared to like what the, the, the environment that we're building it in. And when you, I now live, I live in Toronto at the moment, boo, hiss. Um, and, but that's a city, like other cities like New York and, and London, where the human scale is sort of what defines the environment, right? Like the buildings are the biggest thing. And it's a very different perspective 
I think. And, and, and so there's something essentially, um, not just Canadian, but like Vancouverite about, I think, the way I perceive the world. So yes is the short answer to your question. <laughs> and we have time for one more question oh before uh, we have a very special surprise ending to this event. How's that for a build up? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a similar screenplay question. Sure. Um, but I'd be really curious to know like, what the biggest hurdle or surprise, I guess, in going from writing screenplays technically to writing prose was. Sure. Like, was there anything you encountered you didn't think you would? Well, it's really fun writing a book. I mean, I tried to pass that fun on to the reader. Um, but like, I love writing screenplays, and I love the collaborative process of writing movies, but the thing about a screenplay is no matter what genre you're writing, comedy, drama, thriller, period piece, it's always the same writing style. It's always the third person, it's always the present tense, it's all, you're always exterior to the characters, uh, it's a very lean, like vivid, you know, visually vivid, but kind of lean, laconic writing style. And so the chance to kind of like really, um, to, to, to have the freedom to use any uh, technique in the literary Shed uh, was very was very fun and liberating. At the same time, you know, screenwriting is a very disciplined form. You have to be very disciplined when you write it. Every word matters. Every page matters. Every crazy idea you have costs money. Someone's going to have to shoot that. You can't write anything that somebody can't actually make. Right? You can't write something that a that an actor can't act, or that a director can't shoot, or that you know, um, or that a production designer can't build. And so I think in the end, you, even though I had a lot of fun writing the book, like you still have to bring that same level of discipline um, to the work. You still every word still matters. Every sentence is is either moving the story forward and, and connecting with the reader, or stalling the story and losing the reader. And so I would say that like what I discovered was that it's very different than writing screenplays, but uh, from a um, uh, craft perspective, but the, the discipline remains the same. Every word still matters. Also, people are like, uh, people in the book world are like super nerdy into books in a way that's really delightful. Like in the movie business, there's a lot of, sometimes you do run into a lot of people who are like, do you even like movies? Um, and that's always, an, I mean, that's not that there's also, there's lots of people who like live and breathe and are obsessed with movies, but like you do deal with like a lot of people where you feel like they like they don't like watch any, actually watch any movies. And it is a little, it is different in the literary world, actually. Like everyone you meet, from like the head of a publishing company to like booksellers to publicists, like love books, and I love books, and so that's actually been really nice. It's like people are like, super into books, and you can kind of get into like a great conversation about some random novel with like almost everybody you deal with. And so I've, I've really enjoyed that part of it. Whereas I find in the film business, it's mostly like you have that with your core creative team, but a lot of the people that you're dealing with outside of that um, don't share that love. Uh, I wish it was the case. So that's been, that's. Been a nice thing as well. I hope you're all super into books and buy at least one tonight and have it signed. I hope you'll fill out uh, our feedback form and there's a little plexiglass box and we'd like to uh, have you deposit it there on your way out. But this turns out to be, well it actually it doesn't turn out to be, it was planned uh, for this particular occasion. This is uh, Ilan's dad's birthday. And uh, we thought that we would uh, bring out a piece of cake. <laughs> and uh, if you want to sing happy birthday, you can. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Moshe. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. That's it. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.